Welcome to our webinar entitled, The Complementary Roles of Media in the Brand Adoption Process. I'm Joan Boyce, Group Publisher of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. We're very excited to have you join us today because the topic is truly critical to everyone who sells to the biotech and life science markets. All of us recognize that it's no longer business as usual when it comes to marketing, and it seems that everyone has an opinion, whether about the need for marketing, the rise and fall of different media, the way in which different media options work with one another, and so forth. And, as it usually is, many of these options are contrary to one another. Jen has a vested interest in helping you make better informed media decisions based on data and not opinions. We decided to invest in an independent research project that would offer you a fact-based perspective of reality in the market today. And they are facts as reported by your customers and prospects. Early this year, Jen commissioned Martin A. Kellen Associates to develop and conduct this landmark research project. Marty A. Kell has more than 30 years' experience in sales and marketing and has been president of his own marketing consulting firm since 1987. Located in Chester, New Jersey, his company helps organizations build sales through market positioning, research, and communications. His firm has worked for manufacturers such as GlaxoSmithKline, Novartis, Sanofi Aventis, and Symbol Technologies. They've also worked closely with media organizations such as the New England Journal of Medicine, Medical Economics Company, Dun & Bradstreet, and Marion Lieber Publishers, who are the publishers of Gen. Before Marty begins his presentation, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items. Please feel free to enlarge the slides for better viewing. At any time during the webinar, you can send in a question. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on your lower left of your console and then hit Submit. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A segment that will take place after Marty's presentation. You will also be receiving a copy of the full presentation via email. And now, I'm pleased to introduce to you Marty Akel. Marty? Thank you, Joan, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be working with you today. Uh, when Joan first approached me to conduct this project, the initial issues were pretty straightforward. That is what types of media are researchers using today and likely to use into the future. And that was certainly a valuable goal. But as we started shaping specific objectives, we recognized that only determining how many people are engaged with print versus online versus events wasn't going to provide you, the marketers, with enough perspective and depth on this subject. So we thought more broadly about issues like the basic need for communications programs among vendors, whether professionals are expanding or contracting the time they invest with media, and the relationships among different types of media in moving products forward in the minds of the buyers. The result was this project, and it's entitled The Contemporary Roles of Media in the Brand Adoption Process. The specific objectives we set were to determine, first of all, whether or not branding continues to be important for vendors of research tools. By tools, we mean products, equipment, and systems uh, used in the marketplace. Secondly, we wanted to determine the overall trends in the researcher's use of media. Thirdly, we wanted to drill down uh, in depth in really what is, uh, has become more of a controversial topic today, and that's the degree to which researchers are now engaged with professional magazines and journals. Then on the other hand, we also wanted to determine their engagement with digital media. And finally, we wanted to see if we could determine the roles that individual types of media play in the brand adoption process. And I'll be referring to the brand adoption process a number of times, and by that I mean the four, ste four steps in the brand adoption process. Well, I'll be showing this to you later, but I might as well mention it now. The four steps being, first of all, building awareness of a company and its specific products, awareness that they even exist. Number two is establishing perceptions about what the company and products stand for. Number three, positioning the company and products versus its competitors. And four, establishing preference to contact the company when moving into the buying process. So those are the four stages of the brand adoption process that we'll be looking at. But first, let's take a look at, at the methodology, how this research was conducted. Basically, it's a very fresh project that was conducted about 60 days ago in March. 
the universe that was studied was Jen's worldwide audience of researchers, which was about 107,000 people. And uh, it included those who were engaged with Jen's magazine, its e-newsletters, webinars, and RSS feeds, so multimedia engagement. Market segments, all qualified biotech and life science segments as per Jen's Gen Magazine's audit statement, and you can see there in the lower left-hand corner the, the types of organizations, pharma, biopharm companies, biotech companies, diagnostic companies, private research institutions, contract research companies, act, those in academia, government, hospitals, etc. In addition, uh, the titles that were selected were all qualified biotech and life science titles as Again, as per Gen Magazine's audit statement, this included executive and corporate managers, lab managers, research and staff scientists, principal investigators, professors, postdoc postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, uh, etc. It was the medium was uh, we sent out one email invitation. There was a link to an online questionnaire. The survey was sent out over the Gen title. We used an incent as an incentive an Apple gift card. And our response was 100, or rather 808 qualified returns, which we were very pleased to see that, which gave us a margin of error of plus or minus 3.5% uh, at the 95% confidence level. One of the things that we wanted to do was to ensure, since we, we wanted this survey to be a survey of those who have buying influence in the marketplace, we qualified all of the respondents to their involvement in the selection of research-related vendors and tools. Again, tools meaning products, equipment, and systems. So 100% of the people who uh, respond, were allowed to respond to this survey are involved in the buying process. And this slide simply shows you the ways, the many different ways that they were involved, including take a look at the uh, bar at the bottom. Uh, almost two-thirds were involved in fi the final selection or approvals of uh, uh, research tools. And so quick, a quick conclusion to uh, the methodology was respondents were all, all professionals working in the biotech life science market, all involved in decisions regarding the selection of products. So respondents are well qualified to provide feedback regarding their engagement with the different media and how they use media in adopting products. The first thing that uh, we wanted to take a look at, we wanted to go back to the basics to see is there, does there continue to be uh, importance in terms of, for vendors, in terms of branding uh, the, their products into the marketplace? What's the importance of branding today? And we started by asking the uh, researchers, what challenges do they face today? And we said, compared to four or five years ago, how much more, uh, rather, what, what are the challenges that you, you have today? On the left-hand side in that box, you can see uh, the array of challenges that many of them, or most of them, said, uh, I'm having this, th these are the challenges we have. They, they include things such as uh, obtaining funding. If you take a look at the second, third, and, uh, and fourth bulleted points, those are all related, uh, product-related issues, such as they have a relatively short lifespan for their products that they develop, uh, short patent, or patent life is, uh, patents are about to uh, expire, introducing products in new diagnostic and therapeutic areas, shortening the time for product R&D, meaning bringing products to market even faster, and you can see the, uh, the list of challenges that they all have. On the right-hand side, you can see that nine out of 10 said that they believe that their work today, compared to four or five years ago, is uh, much more uh, complex and demanding. Nine out of 10 said they are facing a more complex, uh, more complex issues today in, in their R&D efforts. Secondly, we see that uh, buyers, in order to overcome those challenges, are relying even more heavily on research tools, products, equipment, and, and systems. On the left-hand side, we see to meet their challenges, 90% said that adopting new research tools is critical or important uh, to their work. However, on, on the right-hand side, you can also see that two-thirds said, well, we, in order to adopt these kinds of products, uh, we are now more open to purchasing from different vendors in the marketplace. Now, that compared to the past. Now, that obviously creates a more competitive landscape where uh, vendors need to protect uh, the business that they have with uh, 
with certain companies. But then again, it's also an opportunity because there are companies that are now in play because they're looking at uh, a broader range of vendors. So there is a more competitive marketplace for vendors today. We also see that uh, prior to considering a vendor or meeting with their reps, buyers also want to have gained prior insight into the company via their communications programs. Again, that's an important concept. Before seriously considering a vendor or meeting with their reps, they want to have learned about about these companies uh, via advertising, promotion, trade shows, et cetera. On the left-hand side, you can see the bar chart, 88%, 9 out of 10, want to have that kind of prior knowledge of vendors. And on the right side, you see the reasons for preferring to have that kind of knowledge. They range from two-thirds said, it lets me know what the vendor stands for. Three-quarters says, it gives me perspectives about where their products fit versus competitors. Notice a number of these issues relate very well to the uh, to, to that, the branding process we were talking about before, awareness, perception, uh, positioning, preference. Uh, Two-thirds said it gives me more assurance that the vendor might meet our needs. Two-thirds, it helps me decide whether or not we should contact the vendor, meaning uh, preference to contact vendors, et cetera, all the way down to uh, I feel more confident discussing the technology and products with the vendor prior to, to, ever, to ever seeing them. So branding uh, uh, is... Uh, is critical in, uh, for these reasons because you want people to take you seriously and you want them to contact you. Um, so the conclusions to, to this section are the sales environment for vendors really has become more difficult. Uh, most buyers are now evaluating more vendors. Before evaluating the vendors uh, seriously, they want to have already gained knowledge uh, of a company and its products. So branding of products is even more imperative today. Uh, vendors who use communications programs aggressively to move products through that branding process are likely to gain a, a, a significant competitive advantage. And here again, uh, is, as I said before, uh, these are the, the four steps in the brand adoption process that every vendor, every product needs to meet needs to move through, building awareness of a company, establishing perceptions about what they stand for, positioning versus competitors, and establishing preference to contact that company. In effect, that's uh, generating sales leads, establishing preference to contact the company when they're about to move into the buying process. Next, we want to take a look at, relative to the branding process, what are the trends in the media available to vendors to, to brand their products? First, we see that, and this is a pretty interesting uh, uh, concept here, that to achieve their objectives, most researchers, 8 out of 10, have expanded the pie of time they spend with professional media. Even though they're very busy today, they haven't reduced the amount of time they're spending. They have increased it. On the bar chart on the left-hand side, uh, we see that versus four or five years ago, about 80% have increased the time invested with professional media. And by professional media, we defined it as uh, media produced for biotech or life, the life science industries. You can see that 40% uh, said, yeah, compared to four or five years ago, I've increased that amount of time significantly, and 39% have increased it on a moderate basis. Then we also said, okay, if you, uh, what, what is the, the net change in the amount of time that you're spending on a percentage basis? Overall, researchers have expanded that pie of time by an average of 31%. So compared to, say, 19, rather, uh, 2005 or 2006, uh, they've increased by an average of 31%. And it's interesting to see we uh, cross-tab this by the respondent's age. Those who are younger are expanding that amount of time to, to embrace information uh, even more at 30, 37, 39 percent, and those who are 50 and 60 years old, as this kind of makes sense, they're less likely to uh, broaden out the, the amount of time that, that they're spending at this point to uh, access professional media. So an important point that uh, that uh, pie of time has expanded. Next, we, we gave them a list of, I think it's uh, 22 different uh, uh, types of media, and we ask them uh, to help meet your challenges and to stay current as a professional, please check all the sources of information you find valuable in your work. We offered 22 different sources. And you can see that uh, 
their they were very distinct in in in, in what they were choosing. Uh, I've highlighted in red. I've, I've ranked the top ten out of the twenty-two. It'd be interesting to take a look at what those are. The number one uh, medium that they find valuable for their work today uh, is magazines and journals, whether that be in print or the electronic editions of that of, of that publication. With ninety-eight percent saying yes, uh, I value that in my work. Uh, number two. Uh, on the, in the lower left-hand corner are websites from magazines and journals. Number three in the lower right-hand corner are seminars and workshops at, at trade shows and meetings. Uh, number four, back up to the upper left-hand corner, uh, e-newsletters, 69% uh, or about seven out of ten find those valuable. Number five in the lower left-hand corner, websites from uh, vendors and suppliers. Number six in the lower right-hand corner, Vendors and ex vendor exhibits at trade show meetings of uh, uh, the majority, 56%, find, find those valuable. Number seven, uh, back to the left side, websites from associations. Uh, eight, in, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, books, whether they be print or digital editions of books, about a little less than, than half find those valuable. Uh, number nine, lower left-hand corner, websites from providers of online content only, where they only have uh, 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 internet information, and in the upper right-hand corner, uh, number 10 is webinars and webcasts. Uh, they uh, found important to access professional information, and those are the, the, the top 10. Certainly, the others find other types of media valuable, but uh, we see, if you take a look at the, the major sections, section A, professional publications, 100% finding uh, one type or, or another valuable, 97% finding professional websites valuable. Uh, 96, the letter C, other professional digital media, and in-person events, 85% unduplicated, uh, find that type of media worthwhile. So uh, the conclusions to uh, this section on uh, the overall use of media is that uh, as more media and larger amounts of information are available, researchers have significantly expanded that overall pie of time. They don't seem to be reducing the time spent with individual media. And we'll, we have more information on, on that. Um, so it does not seem that they have abandoned their traditional media in order to embrace digital media. That pie of time has expanded. In fact, 98% continue to, re to read publications, magazines, and journals. And so as marketers use uh, uh, communications programs to move through the branding process, it's in their best interest to utilize the full range of media, constructing a mix, and that's an imp important concept, the, the mix of media, not just one media, medium ver versus the next, but constructing a mix that includes print, digital, and face-to-face. -face. Um, but item number four is interesting because we'll, we'll see this later, but to effectively brand, rather effectively build integrated programs Marketers must also properly understand and utilize the complementary roles of different media. It's not just knowing that there's different media out there. It's what is the role of each of, of these media at different stages in the branding process. And in a couple of sections from now, we'll be taking a look at that. As I said, it, in, in our, our objectives, we wanted to look at, we wanted to drill down and further understand uh, two major types of media, print and digital. And in this section, we'll take a look at the degree to which researchers are engaged with professional magazines and journals. And again, professional was defined uh, as being published for biotech and life science, the life science industries. First of all, we see that 96% of the respondents uh, indicated that they find their print publications desirable. Here, here we're, we're simply talking about uh, the print versions of magazines and journals, not their electronic, whether their actual print hard copy editions uh, uh, are, are valuable in their work. And so 96%, virtually all, continue to find them valuable. And we ask them why. You can see it's a, a, an array of reasons why they continue to find print valuable. Let's start kind of in the middle where about half or more find it valuable. And the reasons why, 42% uh, said that it offers them random access. They can very quickly flip to any section in a magazine or article. They're tangible. They enjoy physically thumbing through them. Now I'm just going up, up to the top of the chart. They're very visual, bringing information to life with photos, et cetera. 
Uh, they're convenient. They can quickly reach for them and get into them. Uh, they're portable. They can read them in, in the office at home in transit. And the number one reason why they desire, and seven out of ten indicated this, that they continue to find print publications a reliable way to periodically uh, be updated on their area of work, that every month or however often, uh, every uh, uh, semi-monthly, they know their publications are coming in and they can be periodically updated on, on a regular basis. We also asked them, uh, to, to, to uh, the, the question was, despite the fact that uh, the Internet is available to you, can you tell us why, uh, in your own words, you you value uh, your print publications. Well, uh, up, let's take a look at a few of these uh, up at the top on, on this page. This was uh, uh, a 48-year-old uh, research scientist. He works at a company in Philadelphia uh, in the pharma, biopharma uh, company and with an R&D budget of uh, 2 to $5 million. And this person said, uh, print packages the information I need in a convenient format. Only after finding a specific product do I use the web for additional information, and this cuts down my search time. The next person, a uh, 34-year-old research staff uh, scientist at the University of Missouri-Columbia with an R&D budget of 10 to $50 million, said professional print publications remain the primary source for the representation of new ideas, methods, and, and approaches. Kind of looking at... Uh, some of these additional quotes up, up at the top. Here's a 40-year-old preclinical scientist working at a biotech company in the United States, R&D budget $1 to $2 million. He or she said, uh, print publications provide a worthwhile format. The advertisements provide a quick view and allow for additional information to be gathered from the vendor's website to inquire about the potential to solve our current issues. Uh, next, we see a 39-year-old associate director at a uh, uh, contract research organizations that works in vaccines and biologics in the U.S. R&D budget of uh, 10 to 50 million dollars. Uh, this person said, "Print is very relevant. I greatly appreciate taking a magazine on a train, plane, or reviewing it at home. I spend more time per article in print than online." And the last one on, on this page was a uh, from a 56-year-old director at Merck in, here in New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey. Um, uh, and as you'd expect, uh, their R&D budget is a billion dollars or more. This, per <clears throat> excuse me. this person said, I flip through all of a print publication but only read the table of contents of online publications and then click the articles of interest. Hence, print, pub print publications are the best way to access up-to-date information from vendors. And one or two more, the one in the middle here, we see uh, a 47-year-old lab manager who's working at a government agency in Australia. Uh, R&D budget two to five million. This person said, I, found, I find it easier to remember and find an article or ad in a magazine than trying to remember which web page I saw it on, especially if you stumbled upon it following links from other web pages. And lastly, a 42-year-old senior research investigator uh, at Allergan uh, with an R&D budget of 50 to $100 million. This person said, I still enjoy the ability to hold a journal and thumb through it. This relates back to the tangible data that we saw before. I will page through an entire hard copy journal magazine and stumble across things of interest. For the electronic versions, I limit myself and I only look at articles of interest. So there is some depth to the statistics in terms of why they continue to value their print publications. Then we went back to statistics and asked uh, about the researcher's readership of professional publications. And in this case, we're talking about print and or the electronic editions of those publications. And we see that that readership remains strong. On the left-hand side, this is their, we asked about their readership trend versus four or five years ago, and two-thirds says we're, we're increasing the amount of time that we're spending uh, with with. Uh, our publications, only 10% indicated a decrease. In the middle, you can see that, uh, that table. We ask them, how many professional publications do you receive and, and read each month? On average, they are receiving and reading a dozen, 11.8 publications. The median, meaning half above and half below, is nine publications. Then we asked about the future. We said, what about 
the next four or five years? What kind of trend do you, do you think uh, you'll be experienced in terms of reading your professional publications? And 59% said, yeah, we'll probably increase even more our reliance on professional publications. Only 8% see a decrease. We, we thought it would be valuable to look at this information by the reader's age. And uh, regardless of age, uh, even with younger researchers, they're also embracing their professional magazines and journals. On the left-hand side, you see the number of professional publications read each month. Whether you go, uh, whether, you, whether you look at 30 to 39-year-olds, under 30, 40 to 49, uh, versus uh, older researchers, they're all consistent in terms of the number of publications that, that they read, between 10, 10 and 12 professional publications. On the right-hand side, we said uh, we, we looked at the data regarding their readership into the future uh, over the next four or five years by age. And if you take a look at the uh, increase column, um, it, this is pretty interesting. You, you see the, tre the trend. Uh, those who are younger are uh, much more likely to be increasing uh, the amount of time that they spend with professional publications, 85% under 30, 67% 30 to 39. And then if you go to those who are older, 50 to 59 and 60 plus, it's 35 and 44%. So basically the uh, uh, younger researchers continue to embrace professional magazines just like their, their uh, older peers. We then switched gears a little bit and asked them about the advertising content in their professional publications. And we see that the bottom line to, to this is that researchers find advertising in their professional publications either uh, uh, equally valuable or almost as valuable as, as the editorial content because we see 91% – I'm looking at the pie chart here on the left side – 91% welcome the advertisements in their magazines and journals with 61% saying it's important or very important. And then we ask them why. If, if you do va value uh, advertising in your professional publications, why, why do you uh, – why is, what is the reason for it? And let's, let's start in the middle where, oh, about ha half or more – uh, indicated their reasons. 48% uh, said it alerts me to new vendors in the market. Half said it helps me position individual vendors in my mind. Remember, positioning is one of the uh, steps in the branding process. Uh, half said it provides information to request or access more details, meaning it allows them to contact the vendors. Uh, uh, more than half said it offers continuing education on technologies. And Three, three quarters said it alerts me to potential solutions. They're looking at advertising as solutions. They're not looking at it, at it as promotion from some company that wants to sell me something. They're looking at, at it as potential solutions. Then we also asked about uh, their response to advertising in magazines and journals, and we see that it's as vibrant as ever. Uh, with buyers mainly responding by going directly to vendor websites. On the left-hand side, um, we see the, uh, that 51% uh, said compared to four or five years ago, they are responding even more frequently or to the same degree. Well, uh, if you add the two together, you get 84%. They're responding even more uh, uh, frequently or to the same degree as they did 45 uh, four to five years ago, only 6% said they're responding to ads in publications less frequently. If you move over to the right-hand side on the table, not 9 out of 10, 95% said they've responded to magazine and journal ads in just the last 12 months. And how did they do it? Uh, well, first of all, it's pretty interesting that almost half, 44%, said they've purchased one or more products based upon advertisements in uh, publications in just the last 12 months. But how did they respond? The number one way, they went directly to a vendor or distributor website. Uh, also, approximately two-thirds after seeing an ad in a publication, then they went to a broad-based search engine like a Google and typed in the product's brand name to, to locate where to get uh, how to get more information about that product. Obviously, they could have also gone, uh, used the URL in the ad, but for some reason they, they didn't. But uh, other ways that they re have responded is sending emails to vendors. A third have phoned vendors in the last 12 months. And all of these actions uh, net out to 95% have responded to magazine and journal ads in the last 12 months. 
So our conclusions about uh, professional magazines and journals, uh, basically virtually all researchers, including younger professionals, continue to read their uh, publications. They also value the publication's advertising and are continuing to respond frequently. Therefore, despite the, the opinions of some marketers, uh, magazines and journals continue to be a highly effective medium for moving products through the adoption process, from building essential awareness through to the generation of sales leads. So publications should continue to be considered as a fundamental part of today's media mix. Then, as I, I mentioned, we also wanted to drill down on, on the digital side and see uh, what are the trends in engagement with that. Just pardon me for a second. I just need to take a drink of water. Thank you. The question here was, how will your user, how will your use or readership of each of the following professional media likely change in the next two to three years? Most of these were, were digital. One, one was not, and I'll point that out. And we uh, we had one, two, three, four, five, and then on on uh, on the next slide, I think there are five five other media. These are, are ranked in terms of the growth. That they, that they see in terms of their engagement with these types of media. They start with the, the largest growth will be websites from publications and other industry-related portals. With, if you take a look at that subtotal column with, highlighted by the beige bar, uh, about two-thirds of them expect to see an increase in their engagement with websites from publications and other uh, such portals. Uh, also very similar, 58% uh, expect an increase in their engagement with webinars and webcasts, uh, about half increased engagement with e-newsletters, half with online videos. And the one that's not digital here, but we just wanted to put it in to uh, be more all-inclusive, all is in-person conferences and meetings where we see uh, a little less than half expect to expand their engagement with that type of medium. If we move to the other types here, we see about 39% expect to increase their engagement with virtual trade shows, uh, about a third with online social networks and communities that, that are related to their work, uh, about a third will increase their engagement with podcasts, about a third with, with blogs, and about a quarter with RSS feeds. So the conclusions to these are that along with the continued strength of print publications, digital media will be increasing, increasingly embracing uh, uh, a wide range of, of, uh, uh, of media. Therefore, uh, marketers can select from a wide range of digital media to complement other components in their marketing programs. There's a suite of digital media that you can choose from. Number three is, however, as their media mix expands, it's important for marketers to understand the roles of different media in the adoption process, which uh, I mentioned before, and that's what we're going to be looking at next. So our, our issues were, were not just, uh, our objectives rather, were not just to say, okay, here's what they're engaged with, but can we find a way to say here are different media that different that work more effectively at different stages in the buying process? And so we were we we went out to to see if we can uh, measure the roles of different media in that brand adoption process. Uh, first of all, we wanted to ask question more questions about branding and the media, and we 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 said please indicate the five top resources via which you first become aware of and form impressions about most new products and vendors. And the key words there, become aware of and form impressions. Those are the early stages of the, uh, of the branding process, awareness and, and, and perceptions. And so, this, and so they ranked uh, five out of, I think there are 10 media here. And uh, you can see across the top, uh, we indicated how many mentioned it as number one or, or uh, one of the top two. They're no, uh, and the numbers range from 47% all the way down to 1%. I'm looking at the column percent mentioning as number one. And by far, the number one medium where they are, they first become aware of and form impressions is articles and ads in professional publications, whether they be print and or electronic. Uh, then uh, the number two, but uh, uh, pretty far behind, are search results from uh, broad-based search engines such as Google, et cetera, websites from professional publications, all the way down to 1% saying, I first become aware of and form impressions based upon sponsored links on broad-based search engines. Even when you move to the second column where we see someone mentioning that particular medium as their number one or number two medium to become aware of and form impressions about products, 
uh, articles and ads and publications still by far are the dominant medium for that uh, portion of the brand adoption process, uh, of the branding process, rather. Then we wanted to know uh, what, what's the power of different media to do other critical uh, things. And we said, in the last month, where have you read or seen advertisements for professional products and services most frequently? Meaning, where have they been exposed most frequently? Where are they exposed most frequently to advertisers' messages? And we used one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, we had six major types of media here that, that we measured. 45% said, I'm most frequently exposed to sales messages in professional magazines and journals. 21% 21, 21 said websites from publications. So therefore, uh, two-thirds said they are most often uh, uh, exposed to those kinds of messages via media from professional publications. Uh, <clears throat> other types of media shown here, direct mail, about 17%, broad-based search engines, uh, they see ads there most frequently, only about 8%. Then we, we wanted to know uh, another key factor in terms of which media have different strengths. We said, please check the one medium via which you initially learn about most vendors' websites. How do they wind up uh, learning that uh, this kind of uh, web vendor and website exist? And 67%, again, uh, this dynamic occurs from me media from professional publications. 45% uh, first learned about a vendor's website through articles and ads in magazines and journals. 22% from websites from magazines and journals. And 28% first find out about a vendor's website from broad-based search engines. So you can see there, there's a mix over here. But the dominant media for this particular dynamic are uh, professional publications. This next one is that, that we got, this next area of questioning is, is really pretty interesting. We wanted to, to kind of ask a question that, that blends search marketing with, with branding. And we ask the question, when your online product searches, meaning search marketing, when your online product searches result in a sizable list of potential vendors, and almost always they result in you know, dozens or a hundred uh, uh, different uh, uh, vendors showing up uh, when they do a, uh, do a search. So when your online product searches result in a sizable list of potential vendors, how likely are you to investigate the following types of vendors? Let's take a look on the left-hand side, the types of vendors that they were able to, to rate in terms of their likelihood of clicking on those types of vendors. First was vendors that they've done business with before. Secondly, vendors with whom you haven't had contact, but you're familiar with them via ads, online promotion, trade shows, etc. The next was vendors you've heard of before, but you're not really familiar with them. And lastly, vendors who make the products you're seeking, but you've never heard of them before. Well, if you take a look at that, the green bar, the, the subtotal, the first part is a no-brainer. 94% said, I'd click on the vendors that I've done business with before. That's, that's pretty obvious. The second level, vendors with whom you haven't had contact, but you're familiar with them via ads, online promotion, trade shows. 81% said, yeah, I, I'd click on that type of vendor, meaning the vendor that has branded them previously through their ads, online, et cetera, online promotion. Then when you go below that line, the numbers drop precipitously with, with less than half, 46% saying, yeah, I'd click on vendors I've never heard of before, but uh, I'd click on vendors I've heard of before, but I'm not really familiar with them. So meaning those that really haven't been branded, let, it's half of those who are uh, uh, who have been branded, as we see in that, that red line above. And then when you go uh, down to the last description, only 40% said vendors who make the products you're seeking, but you've never heard of them before. So it's pretty clear here that those products that are branded, and we saw which media help brand, uh, brand products, that those products that have been previously branded are, are those uh, via which search marketing then a vendor can, can engage in search marketing much more effectively if they've done their, their prior branding uh, activities. This, this next area is uh, another one that I found uh, uh, pretty fascinating. And th this is the one where we wanted to uh, determine those complementary roles that we were talking about before. 
whether different media, different types of media play different roles as people move through the brand adoption process. Well, we, the question was, when, use, when using the following types of media to learn about products and equipment, at what stages in the information gathering process would you typically be? And we defined three stages for them, early, middle, and advanced. In the early, it's becoming current and familiar with technologies, products, and vendors for potential future purchases. So become early branding stage, becoming current and familiar with technologies for future purchases. Middle stage, identifying an array of alternative products and vendors for current projects or expected purchases. So they want to find out who makes the kinds of products that, that I'm seeking. And the advanced stage is seeking comprehensive information when, when the buyer is seeking comprehensive information on specific products. They're drilling down to find features, benefits, applications for very near-term purchases. So three, three stages, and we uh, offer them one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven different uh, types of media, and we, we, we ask that question of them. At what stage are you at? When you access in the buying process, when you access that type of media, we see that uh, the first two e-newsletters and professional publications, meaning print, oral, electronic editions, their greatest strength is in that early stage, when when buyers are becoming current and familiar with technologies, the early branding stage. That's where those media are, are, are quite strong. Uh, the third one, online social networks, it, it has strength in that early stage. And it's starting to creep into the middle stage, too, where, the, where people are, are identifying alternative products and vendors. So in a social network where people are connecting with one another, they're asking each other, uh, what do you know about this technology? What do you know about vendors in the market? So it's in the early and middle stages. When you move on to, uh, uh, when you look at media such as uh, publication websites and other related sites, online videos and webinars, those media which offer, offer even greater depth of information, they, their greatest strength, uh, while they do have some strength in the early stage, their greatest strength is in the middle stages. In the middle stages, again, when uh, buyers are identifying an array of alternative products and vendors for current or expected purchases. And they have some strength, especially videos and uh, webinars starting to creep into the advanced stage as well. And then as you'd expect, the greatest strength of websites from specific vendors, while they have uh, some strength in the middle stages, the advanced stage is the one where they, they seem to have the greatest strength. So advanced stage where buyers are seeking comprehensive information, you know, uh, specs and, and things like that, that's where websites from specific vendors are of, uh, are of the greatest value to them. We took this very same data and we uh, turned it into a bar chart. And you can see that those, you can see the green represents early stage, the reddish brown, the middle stage, and the blue is the advanced stage. And so it's a little bit more clear here where you can see that e-newsletters and magazines have their greatest strength in the early stages, the early branding stages. Um, uh, social networks uh, are strong in that area as well. And publication websites, online videos, and webinars in the, in the reddish brown have their greatest strength in the middle stages and vendor websites have their greatest strength. Uh, they're, they're strong in the middle and especially in the advanced stage. Lastly, we, we took a look at uh, one other issue, and that is the issue of does it make sense to invest in multiple types of, of, of media as opposed to, say, just one, one medium? And we, we, the question was a vendor can use either a single medium to educate you about their company, or they can use multiple types. When contacted via multiple media, are you more or less likely to do each of the following? And each of these uh, 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 pie charts here, one, two, three, and four, are those four steps in the brand adoption process. So we can see in the upper left-hand corner, item number one, 72% said, yes, if uh, I'm contacted via multiple media, I'm more likely to remain aware of the vendor as an alternative supp supplier. Number two, 58% said if I'm contacted by multi via multiple media, I'm more likely to form lasting perceptions, the second stage in, that, in the branding process. Number three, 61%, two-thirds said I'm more likely 
uh, to position products in my mind versus competitive products if I'm contacted by a multiple media. And lastly, two-thirds said, I'm more likely to contact the vendor when they begin evaluating that class or product if I'm contacted via multiple ty types of media. And then we took a shot here at, uh, at putting this, uh, the information we, we just saw all into a table uh, to suggest that there are certain types of media that you sh would you should consider investing in at different stages in in that uh, in the uh, brand brand adoption process. For example, on the left side, during the early stage when buyers are becoming current current and familiar with technologies for potential future purchases, we suggest that you invest in media that effectively initiate the branding process across the full market of potential buyers to keep the full market aware uh, of your products. Uh, and these, those, those steps in the branding process, again, to build awareness, perceptions, positioning, and establish preference. And the, and the media that are highly effective there on the right-hand side, you can, you can see our magazines and journals, e-newsletters, and social networks. To contact those in the middle uh, stage where they're identifying an, uh, an array of alternative products and vendors for current projects, uh, we suggest that you invest in media that those who have actively entered the buying process use to seek out alternative suppliers and products. There are certain types of media that work well for those who are actively engaged in looking for you. And those would be publication websites and other industry-related sites, online product databases, online videos, webinars, uh, trade show exhibits, and broad-based search engines, because I think broad-based search engines, that's pretty uh, obvious that they'd have their strength in the middle when people are searching for an, an array of, uh, of vendors. And lastly, in the advanced uh, stage, when buyers are seeking comprehensive information, they're looking to drill down for specs and features and, be and, and benefits, um, we suggest you invest in media that buyers use to drill down and learn greater details about individual products. And those types of media are online videos, webinars, trade show exhibits, and supplier websites or your, your own microsite. So concluding that section, we see that among media available to move prospects through the brand adoption process, magazines and journals continue to be the major medium to initiate relationships. Publications are where buyers are initially branded, that is where they see ads most frequently and where they first learn about products and vendors. Again, magazines and journals are very heavy in initiating relationships. Two, different media contribute different strengths to the vendor's media mix. Not every medium does the same kind of thing. They perform different roles as buyers move through stages of the adoption process. So selecting a mix of generic media and the strongest individual media brands will enable vendors to achieve their marketing objectives much more effectively. So kind of summing it, summing it all up and uh, kind of recapping here, in terms of the in environment, uh, vendors are facing a more difficult sales environment. Buyers are looking at more vendors. They're, uh, they, they want to have prior knowledge uh, of vendors before seriously evaluating them. So the branding of products continues to be uh, important. Engagement with media to meet their challenges, buyers are investing in even more t investing even more time. That pie of time has expanded, and they're not abandoning their traditional media. Magazines and journals, both younger and older researchers, continue, continue to be engaged with uh, magazines and journals, and it, it truly is where they for they first become aware of and form impressions about products. They see vendors' ads most frequently. They first learn about vendors' websites. And lastly, digital media, that all types of digital media are experiencing growth. There's no doubt about it, uh, especially webinars, third-party websites like publications and other portals. E-newsletters and videos are the fastest growing among digital media. Uh, complementary roles, different media contribute different strengths. They perform different roles in the adoption process, and what that brings us down to is the need for a full media mix, that utilizing a full mix of media enables vendors to achieve their marketing and sales objectives much more effectively. So the, those are the, uh, uh, that's the research project and our conclusions, and I, I thank you uh, for the time to present it to you, and I'll flip it back to Joan. Thank you, Marty. That was really very extremely insightful. Thank you. You're very welcome. Well, we have uh, received many great questions from our audience, so we do have a few minutes. Um, I'd like to begin our Q&A session. 
So, Marty, I will uh, provide the first question. Okay, I'll see if I have some answers. Not a problem. Really great questions came in. Okay, question number one. The survey results show that buyers are more, more open to evaluating reagents, products, and systems from vendors that they haven't done business with before. Why do you think that is? Okay, so why are they more open now to evaluating equipment and systems? Um, well, we didn't ask the why in this particular study, but we've done, done that in studies of, of other markets. And basically, we've found that buyers are under more pressure today. They need to, to, to move more quickly. They need to, they're under pressure to be more productive. And they find that technology is a, is a, a great way of achieving that productivity and that speed. And you also have into the mix <clears throat> um, that budgets for technology are, are sometimes not as full as in the past, and so there's more at risk with every purchase. They're under more pressure. They may not have a, uh, a budget that's increasing significantly, so there's more at risk. They have to make the right decision the first time. So they're really looking at more alternatives. They have to buy the right product. They have to make the right decision the first time. And as I said before, that means two things to the vendors. They need to uh, hold on to their – need to work to hold on to their existing customers because buyers are looking at their competitors as well. And also that gives them an opportunity as other uh, – uh, as buyers go into play, uh, as accounts go into play, they have an opportunity to pick up new accounts. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, here's question number two. This one's right. a little bit more specific. But uh, here it is. Regarding the use of social networks by researchers, how does that break out by age? Okay, social networks by age. All right, I don't have the, uh, the cross tabs in front of me, but I, I remember looking at this. Um, basically, I think it, it, it breaks out the way uh, we would think it would, that uh, uh, a, a, mo a relatively minor number of researchers who are older in the 40, rather in the 50s, 60s, Maybe uh, 10, 12 percent are. I'm just making up the number, but some, something in that area. Maybe 10, 12 percent uh, value online communities. If you go down to the people in their their 40s, maybe it, that rises to uh, 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 15, 20 percent. And then those who are under 40, 25, 30 percent are, are now finding uh, uh, online communities valuable. So therefore, that. There really is a correlation by age when it comes to social networks and communities. Okay, great. Question number three. The results to your study indicated that using multiple media in a marketing mix moves buyers through the brand adoption process. Why do you think that is? Um, okay, using multiple media and why it's more effective to do that. Um, well, I, I think there are probably two reasons. Uh, first, is pretty obvious. Uh, when you use multiple media, you're exposing the buyer to uh, your sales message more frequently. You're surrounding them with more messages, and so there's bound to be greater awareness and knowledge. You know, moving moving them through the branding process, they're, there's, they're, they're, they're bound to know your products better than if you only sent one message to them via one medium. They're being surrounded by messages. But beyond that, I think there's an even more important reason. And that's when you add media to your schedule, um, and especially media that provides in-depth messaging, such as a, a, a webinar or a video where you're really providing uh, uh, in-depth information. Well, those media generate what we call greater depth of impression, greater depth of impression in the, in the buyer's mind. And the message is then delivered with more detail, and it's delivered with more perspective. So buyers are, are forming uh, more in-depth perceptions about your products and their positioning them in your your in their minds versus competitors. And so the the more frequently and the deeper the message is delivered, the the faster someone's going to move through the brand adoption process. So I, I think th those are the reasons why. Okay, great. Moving on to the next question. This one has to do with Google and keywords. Okay. I spend a good deal of money on Google keywords. I was surprised to see that option scored so low on the slide that shows the top resources where scientists first become aware of and form impressions about new products and services. Why do you think that is? Okay, so why um, are this online search, what is that, why does it come out so low in terms of where people first become aware of and form impressions? Um, well, I... I I think, in my mind anyway, in the research that I've done before, that broad-based search engines, a Google, 
they're, they're not really branding media. They're search media. That's why we call them search engines. And uh, as we saw, to, to brand products, rather to effectively conduct uh, search marketing, products need to have been branded previously that buyers are going to uh, click on those products or vendors that they've previously been branded on before. And only then can you take maximum advantage of search. And search is where people are looking for lists of the right vendors. It's not the branding medium. So I, I think that's why it, it doesn't come up high in our scale on forming on uh, becoming aware of products and forming impressions simply because it's not re truly a branding medium. Okay, great. And um, we have a couple of questions that have come in regarding branding per se. Okay. So uh, this next question is sort of a two-part, and I can repeat the second part. <laughs> you, <laughs> I'll see if I can remember this. the first part. Okay. okay. Here it goes. Um, so you make a lot of reference to the three staging, stages of the branding process. Is one stage more important than another? If I have a limited ad budget for a new product campaign, which stage should I allocate most of my ad dollars? That's part one. And then part two is, um, do you feel it would be more important to brand a company if you are a vendor or product or specific products individually? So did you want me okay. to Okay. Well, um, well, let me have a general reaction and see if, 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 if that covers it. Okay. There's, there's a lot going on there. Um, I look at branding as kind of uh, it's your ticket to, to enter the game. It's, it's, it's your ticket to getting into the competitive arena that uh, to compete at all, to, to, to get into that arena and be a gladiator in that arena, arena to compete for the buyer's, uh, for the buyer's business, you, you need to generate awareness that you exist, um, that you need to form perceptions about what your products stand for. You need to position yourself against competitors and you need to to create a preference for them to evaluate you when they're going to move into the buying process. Um, and most of this starts in that the early stage in the buy in the buying process. That is the early stage. And there are certain media that are going to give you entrance into that competition. Uh, as we saw throughout the uh, the research results, there are certain media that. Uh, will more effectively brand your products, will take you through that awareness, perceptions, et cetera. So um, whether you have a, 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 large, uh, a large ad budget or wherever your product is in its life cycle, if you feel that you need to build awareness, perceptions, position, et cetera, then branding is, branding is necessary. You know, in, in the past, you know, I've been thinking about this, that uh, in the past, by, by past I mean before the Internet was, was around, uh, sales reps were often played the role of what search engines what search engines play today, um, where the salespeople were the ones who used who were being used to identify who the buyers were. Um, but even reps uh, back then, before the internet, the reps that needed their products to be branded ahead of their calls. And so today, we see that uh, search engines take over that that role of. Uh, specifically trying to identify uh, a, a buyer, but even at that point, the uh, branding is, is still absolutely necessary, and that's still necessary, rather especially for those who are trying to launch new products that are start, starting from zero. Um, and whether, I think the last part was, uh, is branding more important with companies versus products? Right. Uh, certainly, I would start with the company uh, and uh, Buyers really today want to know what a company stands for. Is it stable? Do they have the right resources? Do they have the right background? Are they going to be here for me tomorrow? And it starts, I think, with the branding of the company, such as branding of Apple computers, and then then the branding of the individual uh, major product lines under that umbrella. I hope I have answered it because there were, there were a lot of things in there. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts, absolutely. A lot of moving parts, yes. <laughs> well, Marty, we have time for one more question. Okay. So uh, let's see. There's so many good ones here. Okay. Someone asked, uh, here's a good question. What are your thoughts on why the early adopters don't gravitate toward trade show exhibits as a broad means to find out more about vendors, especially as a one-on-one -on -one interaction? 
why they why early adopters, meaning those who are first on, on their block to uh, uh, to evaluate a product, why don't they why they do not gravitate to trade shows? Um, I don't know. I, I haven't done the research. I, I would think whoever asked this question ha has a good point. Um, an, an early adopter, kind of like someone who's a, uh, uh, a say a, a car enthusiast, an early adopter of, of new types of cars that they're going to head to the auto show. Uh, and I would think that that would make sense. Uh, why they would not do it? I don't know. Maybe the recent economic conditions that. Uh, uh, we, we've done research that shows how much more pressure buyers are under in terms of their budgets and uh, uh, are looking for other ways to learn about products because uh, going to a trade show is a major commitment of money and, and time. People are busier, have less money. Uh, perhaps that's the reason, but I, I don't have the uh, uh, any, any proof as to why early adopters don't go to trade shows or, okay. or, or as often anyway. Well, we've run out of time. I did want to state that there are many, many other questions that we did not, uh, were not able to answer during the session, but they are going to give us some food for thought for some follow-up surveys. So thank you very much to the audience. Well, like I said, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, please do note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you miss parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends. And Marty, thanks again for your outstanding pre presentation. You're very welcome. And I also want to say thank you to our audience for your attention and for the thoughtful questions that, you, that came in. In the next two days, you can expect to receive an email from us that will contain a PDF file of the full presentation and uh, also some additional uh, survey results that we didn't display here during the, the presentation. Uh, shortly, we will also be sending you a survey, and we would appreciate your feedback on the webinar. Please look out for it and kindly give us your thoughts, as this, as this will help us to continue to bring you informative webinars in the future. Thanks again.